John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 4. This is God's word, eternally true. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Now look down to verse 14. Verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now look over to chapter 2, and we'll begin in verse 1. John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to his servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw out, draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed in Cana of Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. Here ends our reading. Uh, there's a response of thankfulness that's printed for you in your worship guide or up here on the, on the screen as well. Uh, the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks indeed. Let's pray. We looked at this passage uh, last week and, and uh, what uh, John is doing with the miracles of Jesus um, Many miracles are, are told to us that Jesus uh, did, and uh, John selects seven. And you see in our uh, declaration of the gospel uh, this morning on your front page, uh, if you want to look there, you can. Uh, John writes toward the end of the, his gospel this, Jesus did many other miraculous signs, more than the seven he uh, recounted for us here in his gospel. Um, he did these in the presence of his disciples, but they're not recorded in this book, those beyond the seven. But these, the seven, are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life uh, in his name. Uh, John does something like we talked about last week that's, that's interesting. He calls the, the miracles something the other gospel writers who wrote 30 years before him um, that they didn't call the, the miracles, and he calls, he calls them signs. And so we talked about this last week a little bit, and we'll just review uh, real fast. And so if you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline, you're welcome to do that. Uh, these first ones will come at you pretty fast since we talked about that already, and if you missed it last week, you can uh, catch up uh, wherever. Uh, at your, wherever you listen to your podcasts, <laughs> as they say. Uh, but this, our introduction, a sign points to something. A sign points to something. So we know that on the road, it says, you know, uh, Clayton, uh, five miles, and there's an arrow. Um, or if you're, you're coming in from um, 70 and Smithfield, there's that point that goes from, you know, that directs you to downtown or takes you down to the bypass, which is the worst set of signs in the greater Raleigh area. <laughs> Very confusing. Who hasn't taken the wrong one, right? Um, there. So there are good signs and bad signs. These are good signs. They point us in the right 
in the right direction, but signs point us to something. And so the question is, um, what does this point us to? But but John points us to the fact that in, in John in John 20, verse 30, that Jesus did many miraculous signs. That's your next line there. Many miraculous signs. But as we count them here, we can say there are seven signs that John records uh, for us. But Jesus did many miraculous signs, the first of which is here. Um, the sign that he did when he went to this wedding in Cana of Galilee, northern northern Israel. Uh, but the question is, what were they pointing to? That's your next line there. What were the signs pointing to? And then secondarily, so we'll look at a second thing um, this morning, what they were pointing to, what the signs were pointing to, what John points out to us. But then we'll also look at how we respond, knowing what these signs are teaching us about Jesus. Uh, so there, what were they, these miraculous signs pointing to or revealing, and how should you respond? So number one, uh, number one, um, Jesus' miraculous signs, uh, first of all, they reveal his glory, or they point us to his glory. Uh, we see this in verse 11 there, this, the first of his miraculous signs, uh, Jesus performed in Cana of Galilee, he thus revealed his glory. Uh, John had said in verse 14 of chapter 1, which we read, that the disciples, they saw his glory. Uh, and this is part of it. They were seeing his miracles, his glory. Um, so these uh, miraculous signs reveal his glory. Um, glory is a weird term for us, and we talked about that a lot. That's what we talked about last, last week. What is glory? That's a very religious term, like righteousness and holiness and all these kind of religious terms that are kind of hard to define and glory is a, a hard term to define but we uh, define it simply and if you plug this in when you see a uh, glory it can help you out it helps me out but glory is one's greatness that's your one a there glory is one's greatness or magnificence glory is one's greatness or magnificence that deserves high honor or great honor and high praise. And so a lot of times with glory, there's the idea of something's being revealed in front of us. And there's a response to this. Granting high honor to something or somebody and high praise to them because something's true of them that is great or magnificent. And so Jesus' miracles are signs pointing to that Jesus is great, pointing to the fact that Jesus is magnificent and that he deserves from us high honor, great honor, and high praise. Um, so be there, what is Jesus' glory? That is, what is his greatness? What is his magnificence? that these miracles are, are pointing to and that John is highlighting uh, throughout his gospel. So that's your B. What is Jesus' glory, his greatness, his magnificence that John, magnificence that John is highlighting through his gospel? Uh, so number two, the first, the first aspect of Jesus' greatness, of his glory, that his miracles revealed, uh, was that he was, and this is what we talked about last week, was that he was the special son uh, and rightful king of God's people. He was the special son and rightful king of God's people. And, and that was shown in this miracle. And we looked last week to remind you, how did we get that out of this? Is that, you know, with the king righteously ruling over his people, wine flowed in abundance. That was one of the covenant blessings. Uh, the wine flowed in abundance. New wine, new grain, and that if you had a righteous king like David or like Solomon in his early years or Hezekiah, one of the other faithful kings over Israel or Judah, uh, this was what God promised. A, a covenant blessing came upon them uh, that they would not be wanting. God would send the rain in its time and their crops would be abundant. Uh, vice versa, if they were being unfaithful or if they had an unfaithful king above them, then they were being unfaithful as well, and then they had scarcity. 
God was not sending the rain. There was drought upon them. And uh, they did not have, they were planting much like in the days of Haggai after the exile, uh, where they had abandoned the building, the building of the temple, um, or the rebuilding of the temple, uh, that they were planting much but harvesting little. And so Jesus shows here that he's the great king and that with him comes abundance, like he says in John 10.10. 10. I came that you might have life and might have it abundantly. Uh, and so Jesus is this great king. So that was last week. He's the, the great, he's a special son, the rightful king of God's people. But now the second thing that this miracle is showing, the second thing that this miracle is showing, and that's your three, point three there, the second aspect of Jesus' greatness, the second aspect of his glory um, that his miraculous signs revealed was that he was and also and is also, besides king, he's God. That's a little bit more the obvious one here. Uh, besides king, he's God. This is his magnificence, that this is God dwelling among us. Right? Chapter 1, verse 14. The word who created all things, through whom nothing that has been made was made, the one who created everything made his dwelling among us. And John says, and we saw his glory. We saw his magnificence. We saw him reign as king over the elements. We saw him bring blessing and abundance to us. We saw him bring covenant blessings to people as he did his miracles, like God would do when we had a righteous king above us, but we also saw him create. We saw his glory, the magnificence of God who creates all things out of nothing, who makes matter, physical stuff. And so, A, there in your outline, uh, this, this, second as, this second aspect that Jesus himself is also God himself, um, uh, a there, John shows that what Jesus did, or that Jesus did what only God can do. Esther 3a. John demonstrates through his gospel that Jesus did what only God can do, that is, create matter. Bring something, physical stuff, out of nothing. Uh, we say in our, our Westminster Shorter Catechism, in the question, what is God? God is a spirit. Um, he's existing before he creates, before there's any physical matter he creates. Even for someone who believes in the Big Bang, Big Bang Theory, not the show, uh, uh, someone who believes in the Big Bang, they don't have an answer to where the matter comes from that caused the Big Bang. They don't have an answer to that question. Where did the where did the infinitesimally intense and, and, and dense point of matter come from? And the philosophical answer that, that honest um, uh, philosophers agree to is, and honest philosophers are mostly theists, they believe in God, because there's no good answer to that, where did matter come from, except a God who is not matter, who creates matter. And so that's what John shows to us about Jesus. Um, he, he starts it off, you know, there in chapter one, and he continues it with this first miracle. And that's what Jesus is demonstrating about himself. Um, and, and so John shows that you, what Jesus did what only God can do, create uh, matter. And so here's the argument that John runs through for us. If you like philosophy and logical syllogisms, here you go. If you don't, don't worry about it. But here's what John is doing. Um, one, here's what John does. He shows God creates, speaking all things into existence. And so we saw that from Genesis 1. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. And he speaks things into existence. He says, let there be light. And there was light. 
There wasn't light, but God speaks it into existence. And then there's, and then there's light. And so John brings that in and you look at John 1.1 1, 1, and you see John quotes Moses to start his gospel. In the beginning, and we expect, as John writes to, to, to Jewish believers in Jesus during his day primarily, they expect when they read this, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, but he, he switches it on them, doesn't he? He encapsulates that meaning. He says, in the beginning was the word. And they say, oh, well, who's the word? And he, he establishes nothing was created in the beginning, but by the word. And then verse 14, oh, who is the word? Well, the word is the one who became flesh, whom we saw and we saw his glory. And, and so, so John do, does this. He, he shows that God creates speaking things into existence. That's your 3A1 there. God creates speaking things into existence. That's from Genesis 1. Then he shows, number two, that Jesus creates speaking things into existence, making very sure that we understand this was water. The servants understood this was water. They gathered the water. They put the water, 20 to 30 gallons of it, in each of six water jars. They put water into these jars. They knew it was water. And Jesus tells them, dip some out and take it to the master of the ceremony. And they can see that this water has been made, created into wine. He takes H2O and he adds all this grape juice fermented already. He creates something out of nothing, uh, which God can do. God can make a mountain in the shape of a mountain and a valley in the shape of a valley. He can create a human person, Adam, not as an embryo. He creates. And so Jesus creates. He creates this, this wine. Um, he who created the grape and the grapevine in the beginning now creates the fruit of the vine at this wedding feast. So here's how the argument goes. God creates, speaking all things into existence. Jesus creates, speaking things into existence, sometimes audibly, sometimes not. Um, with Lazarus, we'll see him speak audibly. Lazarus, come out. It's an audible speaking, and sometimes it's just, you know, the internal thinking, the speaking, uh, whichever. Jesus creates speaking into existence things. And then th three, the conclusion, therefore, Jesus is God. Only God can create. Jesus creates. Therefore, Jesus is God. That's what John demonstrates, demonstrates through his gospel. So B, B, John stated that Jesus was the creator at the very front of his gospel. Um, he wants us to know this aspect of Jesus' glory, this aspect of Jesus' magnificence, that this is the one, the one who dwelled among us, was the one who created everything. And there's nothing that's been created, no physical matter anywhere in the universe that he, Jesus, didn't create. So he just tells us from the get-go. Doesn't leave anything up, you know, into question because he starts his gospel with this. By the time we read through verse 14, we know that Jesus is the person of the Trinity who was the agent of all creation, right? Um, so John stated that Jesus was the creator at the very front of his gospel. We see that. Um, Paul does this as, as well. We read in our epistle reading, Colossians uh, 1, verses 15 and 16, that Jesus created all things. He's the person of the Trinity who creates all things. He's the one invisibly there in Genesis 1. When Moses said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, it's not God the Spirit, not God the Father. God, God decreed it. God the Father decreed it, but Jesus created it. And that's what John teaches us in John 1. That's what Paul teaches us in Colossians 1, 14 through 16. So Paul in Colossians 1, 16, 
For by the Son all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and in, invisible, all things were created by him, Jesus. And then C. So John states that Jesus was the creator at the very front of his gospel. And then C. John then demonstrates, he demonstrates that Jesus is creator, creator God through the rest of his gospel in many of Jesus' signs or miracles. So John first just states it, and then he demonstrates it through the gospel, demonstrates it through the gospel, and especially through these signs. Uh, so next line there for you, Jesus creates the matter, the stuff of wine from water in verse 9. That's creator God, glory. He reveals his glory. He reveals that he's creator God there. That's the conclusion of this, verse 11. Jesus revealed his glory. He revealed what I told you at the front of the gospel was true. John's there. He's a disciple of, of John the Baptist. He's come after Jesus with Andrew in chapter 1. He's with Jesus there in chapter 2. And, and John didn't understand completely who Jesus was when, when John the Baptist said, the Lamb of God, and John follows him. John didn't get it, all who Jesus was. But, but then Jesus reveals this, and John could start to make this connection, especially after Jesus explains everything to him after the resurrection. And John can say, ah, when he created that wine, that was creator God creating wine. Um, so John demonstrates this through the gospel. Creates when Jesus creates wine from water in verse 9. Um, then he goes on, he creates an overflowing amount of bread and fish in chapter 6, verses 1 through 15, the, the miracle of the bread and the fishes. This is creator God at work, creating bread. There are a few loaves. He creates enough bread that there are there's more leftover than there was that when they started. A few fish, and he creates it so there's more leftover fish when it's over because he is creating bread and fish because he's the creator. And then he creates human life out of death uh, in chapter 16 with Lazarus. Just like he breathed into life in Genesis 2-7, he pulls, you know, at, puts together Adam out of the clay, and then Genesis 2, 2, 7, he breathes life into him, and Adam became a living being. And Jesus does this in chapter 11 with Lazarus. He lets Lazarus lie four, di four days dead in the grave. And so Lazarus is, again, clay, inanimate clay, physical stuff with no life in him. And then Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. This is Genesis 1 stuff. Let there be light. This is Genesis 2, 7. Breathing life uh, into Lazarus. This is creator, creator God, uh, creator God at work. Um, so the, uh, uh, these are all creator miracles. And then D, in the rest of his gospel, the rest of John's gospel, he shows how Jesus revealed this fact that Jesus is God in other actions, in other actions too. Um, Jesus shows omniscience when he meets Nathaniel. He says, I saw you when you're under that tree. Before Philip, when Philip was arriving, I saw you and what you were doing. That's omniscience. He does the same thing in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well, the Samaritan, with the Samaritan woman. Um, he says, go get your husband. And this is like, Adam, where are you? God knows. <laughs> he says, go get your husband to the Samaritan woman. And he says, she says, well, uh, and, and he says, that's right. You've had five husbands and the man you're living with now is not your husband. And her response, being a woman of little shame, <laughs> of course, she, goes, she tells everybody in, in her city there at Sychar, she says, Come meet the man who told me everything I ever did. That's omniscience. That's a property of God. Um, Jesus knew things that he didn't gain, but he couldn't have gained if he were just a human, a human being. 
Um, so why is this helpful, knowing that Jesus is God and seeing these miracles that show that Jesus is God? Why is this helpful? How does this direct you? Number four, number four, your response to Jesus' greatness, his magnificence as King and God is to put your faith in him with all things in life and death, to put your faith in him with all things in life and in death. Um, Mary did, um, you know, verse three, she says, hey, there's no more wine. Verse five, she tells the servants, doesn't she? She's got faith. Jesus is going to solve this. If there's going to be a solution, Jesus has the solution. Verse five here in this passage, she tells the servants, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. And, and then the servants, they do what Jesus tells them. Verse 8 and, and verse 11. First he tells them, fill these with water. So they fill them to the brim. And then he tells them, second thing he tells them, take some to the master of the banquet. And, and, and they do. Um, our response to Jesus, great king and God himself, is to put our faith in him, to trust he knows what he's doing. If he tells me to do something, it's going to work out. It's going to be good. So our response to Jesus' greatness as king and God is to put your faith in him with all things in life and in death. And that's verse 11. That's, that's the punchline of this. What's the point of this miracle? John says to us in verse 11, he thus reveals his glory to his disciples and his disciples put their faith in him. In other words, John says to his readers, and sh so should you. Put your faith in him. This is God's special son and appointed king for you. This is God himself who made all things. He kind of knows how everything works. So put your faith in him, in life and in death. So how so do you put your faith in him? A, put your faith in Jesus for your eternity. This is the ah, uh, duh, if you've been a Christian or been in the church for a while. But, but this is a point John is making. Trust Jesus with your eternity. Uh, this is why you can have hard things come upon you. This is why you can have unexpected things come to you health-wise, you know, like Carol right now, and say, I'm okay. Um, I'm okay. In life and in death, I'm okay because I have put my faith in Jesus and it really doesn't matter. Like Paul talks about in Philippians 1, he's in jail and he doesn't know if his jail sentence is going to lead to his death. And so he says, you know, I... I, I don't know which to choose. I'm torn between the two. But I'd rather die and go to be with Christ because that's better by far. Uh, but I know it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain in the body uh, for your progress and joy in the faith. So it doesn't matter, Paul says. If I stay, it's to do his work, and that'll be great. If it's to go, then I'll be with him, and that's better by, that's better by far. So we can put our, our trust, as Paul says, in, in, uh, to start out that discussion, for me, to me to live as Christ and to die is gain. We put our trust in, in Jesus for our eternity. Uh, chapter 1, verse 51. He's the one blessed by the Father and through whom a covenant people, a new covenant in Jesus' blood, receive access to the Father when they die. Jesus shows this. He tells this to Nathaniel. I'm the one who gave, gives you access into heaven itself. And this access we see in Jesus' statement in John 14, 6, where he says, I am the way. How do we have access to God? He says, I am the access to God. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father uh, but through me. Uh, if you trust in another to go to heaven, if you trust in another for access to the divine, you will be disappointed. And anything you're thinking about will just be in your own imagination and not reality itself. And so uh, how, is, uh, how is this for you? Jesus says, you know, in our familiar John 3, 16, 
God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, whoever believes. So Jesus is the way. He's the one who gives us access to God. Um, for now, we'll just say in our eternity, access to God. When we die, we go to heaven. But that's for those who believe. Whoever believes in him has eternal life. So put your faith in Jesus for your eternity. He's the way to God. And those who believe in him have eternal life, as we read in John 20, verse 31. That believing, we have life in his name. Now, secondly, put your faith in Jesus also. B, put your faith in Jesus in life. Not just for your eternity, but for life. Trusting him and his behavioral directives for you. Um, the good news is not that just if you put your trust in Jesus that you have eternal life. The good news is also, and this goes into the aspect of Jesus being your king, he guides and directs you in your life. He helps you and me not screw up my life and your life so much with our bright ideas that aren't so bright. Because being God, he knows how we're framed. Being God, he created us. And he knows what's good for us psychologically, physically, socially. And so, so he directs us in how we should talk to people, how we should interact with people, how would you, we should respond to people who do us harm, how should, we should respond to people who do nice things for us, be grateful. Um, all this kind of thing is in his word, directing us. Um, in our lives. And so put your faith in Jesus in life. When you don't know how to respond or how to act in your life, look to Jesus. Put your faith in him. Jesus has an answer for how I respond here, for what I'm doing here in my life. His goodness is not just for my eternity. His goodness to me is in my life as my God, my creator, my framer, and my king who orders me things to do things that are for my own good and for the good of those who are around me. Um, so put your faith in Jesus in life, trusting him, here's your word, in his behavioral directives. His behavioral directives. Those are commands. His behavior, his directives of how to behave. Um, and we can see this in, in verse 5. Mary did, and she tells the servants to do the same. Do whatever he tells you. Um, John, as he writes his gospel, um, writing his gospel to people who were uh, uh, Jews who believed in Jesus, uh, many of them disowned by their mom and dad, uh, by their brother, by their sister, by their religious community that they had grown up in. Um, it was hard for them to do, to obey these uh, behavioral directives um, as they were being persecuted for their faith as well. Uh, by uh, Gentiles too and starting to be persecuted uh, by the government there. It's a hard thing for them to do. Um, Peter recounts this in, in 1 Peter 4. Uh, Peter's talking to a different group of people, primarily um, uh, Gentiles, and he says this to them. He directs them that, that just like Jesus lived in a way that was distinct from the way the world lives, and the way non-believers live. So we're doing that too. And so this is what Peter's talking about is he talks to Gentiles, pagans, who have come to faith in Jesus uh, about 25 years before uh, John is, is writing this gospel. But here's what Peter says in 1 Peter 4.1. He talks about that putting one's faith in Jesus meant walking in Jesus' ways and not the ways we used to walk in before we believed in Jesus. He writes... Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who suffered in his body is done with sin. Jesus didn't mess around with sin, and he suffered for it. And so we should too, not mess around with sin, but this will bring us suffering. He who has done, he who has done, we're, we're done with sin as a result of, he does not live, we don't live our lives, uh, the rest of our earthly lives for human desires, but rather for the will of God. 
For we've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. He writes, but live now for the will of God. But your pagan friends and the pagans around you, they think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissip dissipation and they heap abuse on you. Um, so that's what we experience as believers living in an unbelieving world, Peter says. The non-believers are perplexed by us walking in Christ's ways instead of his, or in Christ's ways instead of their ways, instead of what everyone else is doing, believing what everyone else is believing. And so they, non-believers, heap abuse on us. And this abuse was coming upon those to whom John was writing. And John is, is showing them, this is your creator, this is your king. Walk in his ways. Walk in his ways. Trust Jesus' behavioral directives for you. Don't walk in the ways of the people of this world who don't know Jesus as their God and King. So number one, number one, trusting Jesus and his behavioral directives means, as we've talked about before, that you acknowledge and treat Jesus as your King. Acknowledge and treat Jesus as your King. This is what Mary is doing. This is what the servants are doing. Um, uh, Mary sees this and says, do what he says. Um, she responds to her son, not like a mother to her son. She responds as a subject of her God. She responds as a subject of her king. And she realizes this is the king, do what he says. She's like an emissary or a nobleman or an official of the king. And she tells these other servants, do what the king says. So be a servant of the great king the magnificent and glorious one, Jesus, and do whatever he tells you. That's what our attitude in life should be. Lord, what your will is, what you, how you direct me to do. You want me to be patient with this irritating person? Okay, do whatever he tells you. I hear you, Mary. <laughs> I hear you, John. Do whatever he tells you. Okay, Jesus, I'll do what you tell me. Um... This person's been harmful for me. Be gracious and patient. Forgive. Uh, forgive this other believer who's done harmful things to me. Okay, Ephesians 4.27. Forgive each other just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Okay. I'll, uh, whatever you say, Jesus. You say forgive this person, I'll forgive this person. Whatever it is, we do whatever he tells you. That's your number two. Do whatever he tells you. That's how you treat your king. Um, be like these servants who fill the jars. Um, do you get this? Um, and, and, and do you get the, the, the persecution that perhaps happened to these servants who are filling the jars with water? What are you guys doing? We're not going to worship. This is a, you're, you're filling the ceremonial jars for worship that we might ceremonially cleanse ourselves, that we might worship God. You're filling those now? Get, why? Why don't you get me some more hors d'oeuvres, right? I won't double dip, I promise. Um, you know, and they're, they're, they're wasting their time and they're not serving in these other ways. And they're filling these jars with water. And then, then the other people, the, the party can say, this wedding feast can say, we don't need water. We need wine. Go out to the stores and buy more wine. That's what we need. Why are you acting in this way? Why are you obeying Jesus instead of just doing what needs to be done? Get some more wine. You get this? Can you, can, you, can you feel that? Can you feel the tension of you being a servant doing the will of Jesus in this thing that doesn't make sense? And that's what Jesus, following Jesus is often doing. He's telling us things that, that don't make sense. And that's what real good faith is that honors God when we do something he tells us to do when we don't understand how that's going to work out for us or why that makes sense to do that right now. Um, and there's persecution that comes along with that because it doesn't make sense to us so it's not going to make sense to somebody who's not a believer. 
And sometimes it make, doesn't make sense to other people who are believers and they start to make fun of us. Why are you doing that? And then we got to explain it. Um, but do whatever he tells you, trusting, here's the rest of that sentence, trusting that things will work out. Um, I'm a Beatles fan, you know that. So you know what's coming here. Life is very short. And there's no time for fussing and fighting, my friend. Don't fuss and fight with Jesus. Life is short. Don't, don't, if he tells you to do something, don't, don't blow a segment of your life, even if it's five minutes making a mistake and having, and then you have to make up for the stuff you made a mess of. Don't waste your time. Life is too short, right? Life is very short. Uh, and, and there's no time for fussing and fighting. Don't fight with Jesus. Just, just do what he says. Do what he says. It's going gonna, it's gonna to work out. Um, so A there in your outline, Jesus doesn't speak to his people on earth today audibly. That's Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2. Don't, we're not talking about him whispering something in your ear. B, he does speak, though, to you through his word, the Bible. And that's, that was our... Um, uh, preparing for the hearing of the word this morning, John 16, 12 through 14. He says, you guys, you don't get it yet. And I've got a lot more to tell you. And you're going to have to write the New Testament for me. I'm not going to call it the New Testament because that's not what I call it. But, but, but you don't even understand yet what I'm going to tell you. But I'm going to send my spirit to you. And he's going to take from mine, he's going to take all these things I need to tell you when I'm in heaven above, and he's going to give it to you. The spirit, my spirit, I'm going to send him to you. And he's going to give you all this truth. The spirit of truth is going to give you all this truth. And you're going to write the New Testament for me with these things that you write now before my crucifixion. You don't understand. Um, so how is Jesus the way for you? Through putting your faith in him uh, as his disciples did after uh, seeing this sign uh, as uh, John um, uh, John directs them uh, through this, uh, he gives us his word, the Bible. Um, Hebrews uh, 4.12 speaks about this as well, but we don't want to argue with him. Um, you know, Mary could have argued with Jesus too. Look what he says. Dear woman, and it's just the word for woman or wife. Um, same word he uses in First uh, the, um, uh, Timothy 3 with the wives of deacons. He says, woman, what have I to do with you? Or what's there between you and me? It's a hard, it's a hard verse to translate there. Um, he says, a woman to you uh, and to me. <laughs> uh, but she could have argued with him. Is that any way to talk to your mom in front of all these people? She doesn't fuss and fight with him. What's her response? She looks at the people around her and she says, do, it, do what he says. Do what he says. Or the servants could have said to him, we don't need water. We're not celebrating. You know, we're not going to, to worship God. We need wine. Do you have any money to give us to buy some more wine? Do you have any wine? Do you know of a special closet that we can go to where there's more wine? Do that for us. But no one fights this, and none of them can foresee what Jesus is going to do. Mary didn't know what he was going to do. She just says, whatever he says, do it. The servants couldn't suppose what he was going to do. And when they take that, that water out to take it to the master's servant, whether it was wine already then, but at least by the time they get it to him, it's wine. They couldn't foresee that he was going to do that. But what do they do? They obey him. They do whatever he tells them. And that's, that's true, real good obedience. When you do something, because Jesus has told you in his word, the Bible, before you understand why he's telling you, why he's telling you uh, to do it. Um, that's life with Jesus. He tells you to do things in scripture that don't make sense to you, uh, that seem to be a waste of your time, that seem to be counterproductive, um, that will make you look goofy or stand out in a way you don't want to stand out. You're going to have to explain yourself. Why are you doing that? Uh, in a way that'll make you get persecuted. Um, 
But John says to you here, God says to you now and through all your life, I know it doesn't make sense to you. Just trust me. Put your faith in me. Verse 11. Put your faith in me. Do what I've told you. Just fill those pots with water. Um, and it'll work out. Um, you know, I, I, I run. I, I could tell you my illustration about the, the basketball, you know, the hook shot thing or the, the playing third base and, and, and keeping the guy on third and throwing the first. Uh, but I decided to pick out a new one for you here uh, about uh, trusting when you don't know why. Um, so, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've run hard since I was 37 years old. I quit running after I was 20, 21 when I was finished playing soccer, but 37 years old, just ran hard. And every time I'd go out, I'd just run hard, hard as I can, uh, try to break a record. Every time I went out, I'd go out from 25 minutes typically and, and try to get as far as I could in 25 minutes. Now, I did take a loop around, so I was near home. Um, uh, when it's coming. And I did that over and over and over again for, for years. And then I got in a, 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 a running coaching system online. Um, and, and they said, if you want to run faster, if you want to, if you want to break your records, you got to run slower in your training, really slow. And so I went from running on a, on a slow day, about seven, uh, seven minutes a mile, on a fast day, about 6.35 a mile in my training, to running uh, about nine minutes, 9.30 per mile in my training for long distances for a long time. Instead of 25 minutes going fast, I'm going an hour and a half, two hours, going really slowly. And they say, just trust me, just trust me. So I get in this program, I run, I run this, and I'm, I'm running, running along uh, long distances, very slow. And it was very hard at the beginning because it was slower than my cool down speed to, 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 run, that, to run that slowly. And uh, uh, last May, a year ago, I, I ran a 5K. Now, here's my 5K history. And for about eight years, I, I ran a Clayton 5K and fastest time was 1951. Longest time was 1959. Let me repeat this time, 1951-1959, an eight-second difference, eight years in a row. No matter what I did, I was in those eight seconds over and over again, no matter how hard I was training for this. So they had me run slowly, run slowly, run slowly. Still did some speed work, but 80% of my work just at, at, you know, and they say, so that you can have an easy conversation with somebody. And I take 20 seconds off my 5K time. 20 seconds, that's huge. You know, I couldn't take two seconds off that, that little thing there. And I came in, it took 20 seconds off. See, and that's just their pros. I didn't run track, I didn't run cross country. I'm just out there running. But they know what they're doing and they train athletes in South Africa is where they're from and for a 54 mile race. <laughs> and they train at Olympic athletes. And so I just trust them. Say, I don't know how this works, uh, but I'm going to do this. But that's what Jesus asks you to do. He says, sometimes it doesn't make sense. Sometimes I just say, you know, do this and, and, and trust me. Um, sometimes you just need to trust the expert. And to not say, but I've done this and I can't, you know, just trust the expert. And that's Jesus. He's God and he's king. Now, number three, know this, um, doing his directives, putting your faith in him and his directives for you, uh, putting your faith in him will make you blessed now. It'll make you blessed now in your life. And, and that's, that's the picture here. They're celebrating a wedding. They're, they're feasting, and this was throughout a week. It was a week-long celebration. They're feasting. They're rejoicing. These two people that we know in our village are getting married. They're going to live their lives together. And everybody's happy. And Jesus is blessing them, um, giving them this. Again, like last week, qualifications. Scripture you know, says, don't get drunk. Uh, that's, that's sin. But he's blessing them uh, with, this, with this wine in abundance. Doing his directives will make you blessed in your life. Uh, Romans 8, 28, we know that all things God works out for the good. When you do his directives, he works that doing out for the good 
for those who love him. That's you as a Christian. You love him and have been called according to his purpose. You've been called with the gospel to him to be one of his. So Jesus has called you according to his purpose and you now love him. And so he's working things out for your good, for your blessing in your life. Uh, being called in the Christ kingdom, you now have this promise from God that all things is, are being worked out for your good and that you will be blessed in the doing of his directives, the directives of your king who's sitting on his throne in heaven, who's given you this book, his directives for you, not to spoil your fun, but to make your life great, to make you have satisfaction in your life. And, and so we read from, we read from James chapter uh, two, where he calls the law, the royal law. That's the law of our King Jesus, the royal law that gives, not imprisons you, that gives freedom. Freedom of your conscience, not to feel guilty. Freedom to know that all these choices that you direct, that you uh, um, reject, these choices that you reject, you don't have to worry if you made the right choice or not when you forgive somebody, when you're patient with somebody. That's freedom. Not knowing if I'm doing the right thing or not. Freedom from worry because the one who framed you has told you what to do. But James says in James 1.25, when you look at Jesus' directives for you, it's like looking in a mirror. And Jesus says, here's who you are. You're the image of God. You're the reflection of my glory. You're the reflection of my character on this earth. And so walk away remembering what you've seen in the law and live it out. Don't be like a person who looks in the mirror and then forgets that, you know, thinks he has, you know, red hair. You know, I don't have red hair. It's a, a preposterous thought for me uh, or, or thinking that I weigh 250 pounds and a muscle bound. Okay, that, that would be a preposterous thought for me. But looking in a mirror and remembering who I am. And when I look in scripture, it says, you're a Christian. You're a child of Jesus who's given you his law. And here's what he's told you to do. And so I turn away from that. I turn away from my looking at scripture and I go out and I live my life according to this and you know i love what he says here at the end the one who looks intently into the law the royal law that gives freedom and continues to do this looking at the law not forgetting what he has heard but doing it is blessed in the doing um, jesus so so mary says do what he says for you to do and it's awkward but the servants do it anyway, and then they've got a lot of wine. They're blessed in the doing, even when it doesn't make sense for them. Why? Because they've listened to the one who created all things, who can create, who can make circumstances just change by his sovereign hand. Going from a situation of want and disappointment to a situation of, of feasting. Um, that's what Jesus does for us. And so we walk in his ways. We put our faith in him, not just for our eternity, but we put our faith in him with the way he tells us to walk in our lives. Knowing that he's just telling us, here's the way to blessing. That's what his commands are. Each of his commands are, here's my way to blessing. So our summary here, summary. Jesus is magnificent. He's one of glory of high honor and high praise. Jesus is magnificent because he is king, because he is king, and is God. Jesus is magnificent because he's king and he is God himself. Thus, it makes sense for you to put your faith in him. He's God's anointed king, God's special son, who directs you in your life. Um, so put your faith in him, one, for your eternity. That's your next word there. He puts you, you put your faith in him for your eternity and for your behavior now. Put your faith in him for your eternity and for your behavior now. Faith in him will work out for you. Faith in him will work out for you. It will 
bless you. Faith in him will bless you. Faith in him will bless you both now as you walk in his ways and in the life to come. This is where John is at the end of his time with Jesus and now almost at the end of his life. He's just begging his reading audience. I know it's tough to follow Jesus right now. I know people reject you. Your own family rejects you because you're following Jesus because you're Jewish and you're supposed to be Jewish and among those who rejected Jesus as our king and you're following him as your king and saying he is God. I know it's tough, but John says to us, do what he says and you'll be blessed. This is what I experienced over and over being around Jesus and what I've experienced now for the 60 years since he's been back up in heaven. Let's do the same. Let's pray.